we've been studying um, the life of David over several weeks, and so I'm going to ask you to take your scriptures and turn to 2 Samuel chapter 11. 2 Samuel chapter 11. Before we study God's Word together, let's pray. Lord, I come to you asking your comfort to Lisa and Bob And especially this morning, I'm asking you, Lord, to bring comfort to Lindsay and Jason and Cindy and Brian and Lynette. And take this little one that has come into your presence. Hold her close to your chest. Heal her. And send your Holy Spirit to bring comfort to mom and dad, grandparents, great-grandparents, aunts, uncles, brothers and sisters. Now, Lord, we pray for the one who teaches this morning, forgive him of his sins, for they are many. We've come here to see Jesus and him only. It's in his name we pray. Amen. I did not want to preach this message today <laughs> because it is an uncomfortable PG-13 message. And, um, you know, I like my heroes to not have feet of clay. And David has feet of clay. So let's read this. I'm going to read a portion here and then I'll read a poem that he wrote as a result of this incident in 2 Samuel chapter 11. Verse 1 says, It happened in the spring of the year, at the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him, and all Israel. And they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman. And someone said... Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Iliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers and took her. And she came to him, and he lay with her, for she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house. And David conceived, or the woman conceived, so she sent and told David, and said, I am with child. By the way, these are the only recorded words in the scripture that Bathsheba ever said. I am with child. The Bible never flatters its heroes. All of the men and the women of the scriptures have feet of clay. And when the Holy Spirit paints a portrait of their lives... He's very realistic in his depiction. He doesn't ignore and he doesn't deny or overlook the dark side of our biblical heroes. Now personally, when, when I look at this chapter in David's life, I am forever grateful that God has stopped writing scripture. Because I don't want my story to be in the scriptures, to be read for generations after generations after generations, studied in Sunday school, dissected by pastors, Hollywood making movies out of it. I'm glad the scriptures are over, that they're sealed, that all we have is right here. 
I bet David wished that they would have ended a little bit sooner. No sin, except for the sin of Adam and Eve, has gotten more publicity than the sin of David and Bathsheba. And the way you almost see it as it's depicted, especially out of Hollywood, is that it almost depicts David as this, this sex addict that cannot control his animalistic desires. But nothing could be further from the truth. This is not David. It's really not David. I mean, he's a sinner. But what I hope that you'll see today is that his sin is no greater than ours. Difference in kinds, but a difference in degree, but not really different in kind. Now, I think it's intensified because we have this idea of David. When our heroes fall, they fall, they fall, they fall very hard. But you and I cannot afford to cluck our tongue and shake our head at the sin of David and say, well, how could he have done such a thing? Because that means we have forgotten the warning that Paul gave us in 1 Corinthians 10, where it says, let him who thinks he stands, what? Take heed lest he what? Fall. And wedged between stand and fall is this little phrase, take heed. It is good for those of us gathered here today to take heed. Now the challenge that I have with this text is that I'm sure that I'm not preaching to a church full of adulterers. And because we're not all adulterers in the room here, um, it's easy for us to say, well, I picked a fine day to come to church. This isn't my particular sin. And I sure think of a couple of people that should be here, but it's not me. And if that is the case, I just want to remind you that David's flesh and our flesh are equally weak. David has loved God his whole life. And when he was just a little boy, and he would take care of the sheep, he would experience the shepherding presence of God because as a sheep would get in danger with a lion, David would come and he would feel the power of God on his life and he would defend the sheep from the lion or the bear. When he was a little bit older and everyone was scared of Goliath, no one wanted to fight Goliath, David said, I'll take him. I got this. The battle belongs to the Lord. Me and the Lord. Five foot smooth stones. We, and he prevailed that day. And the Lord was mightily on David. When Saul came into David's cave, when David and his men were in the back of the cave, and Saul was there, in the, and, and, and he loved God so much that he wanted to honor God that he did not kill Saul, and he could have. And then when the ark, who was the, represents the presence of God, was coming into the city of Jerusalem, David was so filled with love and adoration for God, he could not contain himself. He did the most unbaptistic thing he could do. He danced before the ark in the joy of the Lord. David loved God. He poured his heart out over and over and over again in psalms and poems. He loved God. And you look at this man who loved God so much, and you have to ask the question, David, how could you? How could you do this? But now let me ask this a little differently. Turn it around a little bit. Who in this room is so certain that you are so much more spiritual than David that what happened to him could never happen to you? Who's more so spiritual as to say something like that? Is that you? You? Sometimes we think that because adultery is not our huge temptation to us, that somehow we're more spiritual than those for whom this was their problem. And so, if that could possibly be anybody here today, I just want to needle you just a little bit right now. Is that okay? Well, I'm not asking permission. I'm just telling you warning. I'm needling you right now. Your sin may not be sexual sin. Your sin may not be sexual temptation. Maybe your issue are words that come out of your mouth that cut people to the core. 
Maybe they're angry words or bitter words or words filled with sarcasm. And when you speak those words to a spouse or to a child or a friend or co-worker, and you see their countenance drop, and you see that your words have done more damage than any knife wound could, and you think, oh dear God, I've done it again. And you'd give anything to be able to cut your tongue out so it would never happen again, but you know that it will. Maybe that's your sin. Or maybe there's a kind of an arrogant and judgmental spirit about you. I mean, you just know how everybody should live. You know what the Bible says. You know what theology is. And you know how people should manage their life. And clearly the people around you or in your family or your kids or your parents or whomever are not living their life right. And you know it. And you have this bitterness like bile in your soul. And somehow it leaks out in conversation. And you wonder, could I ever just be a loving and gentle human being? Could I ever just be like the gentle rabbi and just love without judging? Or maybe your life is caught up in a web of deception and you wouldn't know the truth if it slapped you in the face. You wouldn't know how to speak the truth. You would speak a lie when the truth would fit better, my mother would say. Or maybe there's kind of a coldness in your heart. You know, a distance. For some reason, everybody else gets all warm and loving and towards God and the things of God, but you just look at it and go, I don't get it. I just, I don't get it. It's cold. God is like a clockmaker out of the universe. He doesn't really care about me. And there's this distance between you and him. And you, you know this is destroying your soul, but maybe you're not willing to do anything about it. See, I think the great problem that the church, especially a church like ours, I think, is that we tend to underestimate our own fallenness. We, we tend to think that we're, well, well, we're not drug addicts, you know. We're not addicted to pornography. You know, we're not like those people. We're, we have little sins, small sins, little white lies, little things we do. But basically, we're, we're pretty good people. And we underestimate our own fallenness. And we look at this guy like David and we think, how could a man after God's own heart do such a thing that would cause his entire world to come crashing down around him? So I want this morning to just say to you that I think we can learn from David about what we can do to prevent broken worlds and maybe even to repair them. So I want to pay attention to two crossroads. David faces two crossroads. And we're going to see the crossroad of drift and the crossroad of warning. Just two. There were so many, I had to just choose a couple. The, the crossroad of drift. Here's the first one. David just, he doesn't run away from God. He doesn't turn his back completely on God. He just turns a little bit. He just starts to drift a little bit. You ever been driving down the road and, and your mind starts to wander and you look off at a beautiful scene out here, maybe a mountain peak or something, and all of a sudden you look up and you are almost off the road. You, you didn't do a right turn, but you drifted off the road. I think that's what David did. He's just started to drift. And I see it in verse 1 of, of uh, 2 Samuel 11. Look at it in verse with me, please. It happened in the spring of the year. There it is. It happened in the spring of the year. So we're coming up on spring. Feels like a spring day. Be very aware that this could happen to you. It happened in the spring of the year. At the time when kings go to battle. And it's stated in such a way that this was a normal matter of course. Just like it's spring. The Rockies are going to Arizona for spring training. It's just what happens at this time of the year. The time when kings go out to battle. But David and sent Joab and the servants with him and all of Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David did what? David stayed in Jerusalem. He didn't go. I don't need to go. I've trained Joab well. I, I've gone there. I've done this before. I don't need to go. 
And David may have forgotten that that's what it meant to be king, to go into battle, especially if you're a warrior king. And that's what the people had said they wanted in a king. 1 Samuel 8, 20 says this. It says that the people said, we want a king who will go before us into battle. That's the kind of king we want. And that's the kind of king David had always been. He led from the front. But not this time. Not this spring. This spring, he decides, I'm going to stay home. Now, as best we can figure, David's about 50 years old, which is by no means an old man. Amen? Amen. Come on. There's only one or two of you in here think that's old. The rest of us think, I'd love to be 50 again. David's not an old man. By any stretch of that imagination. But he wasn't a golden boy anymore either. The girls didn't look at him the same way they did when he was a young man. He's starting to get a little bulge around the mid you know, area. And he's thinking, you know, I need to start working out a little bit more. And maybe he starts to use Rogaine. And he thinks, I'm going to put a jogging track around here in the palace. And he's not going to tell anybody, but he's going to start putting some Metamucil in his royal diet. He's just, he's just thinking, I need to do something about this. Maybe he feels like he's, his youth has passed him by. Maybe he doesn't feel alive anymore. He doesn't feel vital anymore. He doesn't, maybe he's just a little bored. So he says, you know, I, I'm not going to go. I'll just stay home. Now, we don't know really what went inside of David's mind, but here's what we think we know based upon what is not written in the text, and that is that it, David didn't talk to God about this idea. You follow me? David didn't spend any time in prayer and saying, Lord, is it okay if I stay home this year? We don't have any record that David brought this sense of restlessness, this sense of, of boredom, this sense of loss of vitality then, and to God and said, God, I don't know what to do with this. We don't get any sense from that. David is very quiet before the Lord and he stays home. He did not talk to God about this. And what I found to be fascinating that I'd never seen before in studying this text is when you turn over to 2 Samuel 12 and after Nathan has confronted David about this great sin and said, Thou art the man. Halfway through chapter 12, verse 7, you read these words coming from Nathan's lips but are the words from God to David. Look at what it says. It says, I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you from the hand of Saul. Verse 8. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I also would have given you more. Oh. I've had my eye on you since you were a boy. I've poured out my love on you since you were a child. I've protected you. I've been with you. I've provided for you. I've given you supernatural abilities to do things. I have been with you all this time. And you did not come to me with this ache of your soul. Why didn't you come? Why didn't you talk to me, God says? If that has been too little, if giving you all of that was too little, I could have given you more, but you didn't ask. I think of how often in human history God has said that to his people. If all this had been too little, I would have given you more. If more would have made you content, if more would have settled your soul, if more would have made you content where you are, I'd have given you more. But more rarely makes us content. But David's problem is that he didn't trust God. He didn't really, really, really believe that God had his best interest at heart. He did not trust that God was good. David thought, I expect. He thought, no, i got to do what's right. And virtue is a good thing. I ought to walk the straight and narrow path. I think he thought things like that. 
But inside of him, there was a part of him that says something like this. If I abandon myself completely to God like that, I'm not sure God will give me the desires of my heart. David thought, like so many of us really do, deep down at a soul level, down deep where the knobs are inside, and when it comes right down to it, I'm really going to have to look out for myself. I don't really think I can trust God to take care of me. I've got to do this myself. And I think that's behind much of human sin. We just don't really trust that God is so good that he is saying to us, all this I've given to you. And if that was too little, I could have given you more. If that would have calmed you down. If that would have given you contentment. Yeah, you know, I think David should have spent some time with God. This God who wants to bless and wants to, and waits to give and to figure out why he was drifting. He needed to ask himself some hard questions. Like, why is another man's wife more beautiful to him that he's willing to risk the loss of his kingdom to attain it? He needed to ask himself that. He needed to ask himself what was lacking in his walk with God that made him think holding Bathsheba in his arms was more important than being held in the arms of God. But he didn't ask those questions. He just drifted. So here's a question. Will you today, and the reason I'm saying today, because I don't know about tomorrow, and you don't either. Will you today take time to go to God and pour out your heart. Will you trust God enough to care for the deepest part of your heart? And if he chooses not to give you what your eye is on, will you trust that that is good for you? God, I'm a little lonely. I have pain. But I'm going to hold you real close. And I'm going to trust that there is a good reason. And at some point in the future, in spite of whatever disappointment I may experience, I'm going to hold on to you. I'm going to ask you to do that, ladies and gentlemen. Because that is a very important crossroads. And the reason it's so important is because when you're in drift mode, it is very difficult to hear warning signs. I always want God to put up roadblocks so I won't sin. I want God to bank, take the bridge out so I can't cross the river into sin. I want God to put a big bouncer there, you know, and just say, you cannot, I want him to have Gandalf on that bridge stamping and you cannot pass. I want something to stop me. And that's not what God does. You know what God does? You know how his warnings go? They go something like this. Psst. Psst. Don't do that. And when you're drifting, it's really hard sometimes to hear those. But when you are in a place of intimacy with Jesus, every single day, whispers are something you can hear. The warning that David missed is in verse 3. Would you look at it in your Bible? David sent someone to inquire about the woman. And the someone came back with a report. It, this is Bathsheba, daughter of Iliam, 
wife of Uriah the Hittite. Now, I've been asked, is, is there some fault with Bathsheba here? I mean, what woman bays out in the open like this? I mean, isn't there some responsibility that she has here? And the problem with that, I don't, I don't find any indictment in this story about that for her. There's a good chance that what was going on here is that in the afternoon is when the sun has been beating on the rain barrels the most that day, and the water was probably the warmest it's going to be. And the men are out doing what men do, and this was probably a customary time of the day for a woman to take a bath. And so that's what she does. Now, while she's doing that, David sees her through no fault of hers, and he begins to objectify her. Now watch what happens here. You'll notice that she's really not described much except this beautiful woman. She's treated as kind of an object by David. You don't read how she feels about this arrangement. You don't read anything, and there's no mention of what she says to David and what David says to her. She's just something to be used by David in this story to fill a, an ache in his heart. Maybe she will solve my loneliness problem. Maybe she will fill this void. Well, that's, that means she's nothing more than a beer. She's nothing more than a website. She's nothing more. <laughs> she, he's using her to medicate himself. He objectified her. See, when sin gets a hold of you, you begin to treat other people like that. They become objects to be used. And so the servant comes to David and says, um, this is Bathsheba, daughter of Iliam, wife of Uriah, the Hittite. Now why that's significant is this in general in the Old Testament. When you start to talk about the lineage of people, you might talk about their ancestors, you might talk about their offsprings, but you typically did not talk about the spouses in a lineage. This servant is pretty gutsy. This servant is coming to the king and says, this is somebody's wife. This is somebody's daughter, David. What are your intentions here? Be careful. That's a crossroads. This little inner voice, Psst. somebody's daughter, somebody's wife. That little pst can come in the voice of a friend. It could come because you thought, of all the days to come to a church service, I come to this one and that big uh, ugly preacher up there is talking about this. That could be the voice that says, Psst. think about it. Think about what you're doing. This is a crossroads. Now, we have increased our traffic lights by 100% this year. And uh, so traffic lights are not a big issue at Buena Vista. I, I wish we had one right out here. I don't care about Crossman, but right out here in the summertime especially is very important to me because I can go home quicker. But you know what I've noticed about stoplights? whether you live in the city or our little two stoplight town, there are three colors on a stoplight. One is red, which means what? Stop. And green means what? But there's this interesting, ambiguous color right in the middle. It's yellow, and it means what? See? There's the problem. The problem with yellow is that it could mean, from some people, Put the brakes on. Enter this intersection with some trepidation, caution. In fact, don't even go in. That's what caution light means to some people. But to other people, a caution light means pedal to the metal. Floor it. Just take your chance that you can dodge anything coming through. That's what the caution light is. Do you know what verse 3 is to David? It's a caution light. And David has an opportunity to put the brakes on or he has another option. And that's to hit the gas. And 
he is the gas. And he goes right through. If David were at a spiritually sensitive place with God, that statement in verse 3, this is someone's wife, this is someone's daughter, would have stopped him in his tracks. But thinking is the last thing that David is doing right now. And so he just presses on the gas. So let me pause and ask this. Is a specific temptation captured your mind? It might not be adultery. It might not have anything to do with sexual sin. But is, has a specific kind of sin captured your mind? And perhaps you haven't crossed very many lines yet. But you're about to. And God's brought you here today. Of all days. And you're hearing or seeing a caution light. Be very careful what you do next. Because it's been my observation over the years that the devil never tips his hand when it comes to temptation. He shows you only the beauty, the ecstasy, the fun, the excitement, and the stimulating adventure of a stolen desire. That's all he shows you. He never tells a heavy drinker Tomorrow morning, you're going to really regret this. Or, there's a DUI in your future. Or, there's an accident, and you're going to kill some people. The devil never says that. The devil never says to a drug user, this is the beginning of a long, sorrowful dead end for you. He never tells a thief, you're going to get caught, and you're going to end up behind bars. And he certainly never tells an adulterer, this will destroy your family. There's a good chance a pregnancy could happen. There's even a possibility that you catch a life-threatening disease. The devil never says stuff like that. In fact, when the sin is done and all the penalties of that sin come due, the devil is nowhere to be found. He smiles at you as you fall, but he leaves you with no encouragement as soon as the consequences start to kick in, and they always kick in. Now, that's all I really want to say about this, except one little last thing. You know how the story ends. You know how David tried to cover it up, how David brought Uriah back, tried to get him to sleep with his wife to cover up his sin. He tried twice. Did you know that? He tried twice. The second time, he actually got Uriah drunk. He, the king got Uriah drunk. He says, go, go, go be with your wife. And Uriah would not do it, which proves that Uriah drunk was a better man than king was sober. He wouldn't go. So David sent word through Uriah's hands, you take this sealed orders back to Joab. And in it was a death warrant for Uriah. And he goes back and he gives it to Joab, and Joab has him killed in battle. And David has covered up everything. He thinks, it's done. I am so good at this. He's covered up his sin. And almost everybody knows nothing about this sin, but there's one person you cannot hide sin from. His name is God. And so God comes to Nathan and wakes him up and says, I've got something for you to go say to the king. And Nathan comes back to the king and confronts David about this sin with telling this powerful story. You can read about it in 2 Samuel 12. But eventually, Nathan says, Thou art the man. And David is torn up. He's undone. He is so broken. He does not know how to go on. And the only thing David knows to do is to write about it. He pours his heart out in at least two places. In the book of Psalms, Psalm 32 and Psalm 51. And in Psalm 51, there's this phenomenal place in verse 4 where David says, this is his confession, this is his heart being poured out because of what he has 
has to come to terms with. He says in verse 4, against you and you only have I sinned. Now wait a minute. Didn't he sleep with Bathsheba? Didn't he sin against her? You hear what David's saying? David's saying, against you and you only have I sinned. And what David has really come to terms with, ladies and gentlemen, is this. There is a sin underneath the sin. There's always a sin underneath our sin. And the sin underneath the sin of adultery with a woman or a man is sin of adultery against God. It's always that way. Before I committed physical adultery, David is saying, I committed spiritual adultery. Before I committed adultery with Bathsheba, I committed adultery against you. I wanted her arms because I could not feel your arms anymore. I wanted her beauty because I didn't have your beauty anymore. The drift took care of that. I wasn't in your arms. I wasn't thinking about your love. I had lost being ravished by you, God, and your unfailing and steadfast love. That was lost to me. And that's why she was starting to look so good. And so he says in verse 1 of Psalm 51, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Create in me a clean heart, O God, he says later on, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. I need you. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. I need you. I need your love, your unfailing love. I need it. And he returns. So, ladies and gentlemen, stop the drift, heed the warning. And fall in love with Jesus again. I watched the movie not too long ago, The Bridge Over the River Kwai. Anybody watch that film? It's a good movie. Old movie. Alec Guinness plays this British officer and he recognizes that the British troops are in such disarray. They needed something to focus them and the Japanese wanted them as slave laborers to build a bridge over this river. And Alec Guinness thought, this is a good place for us to get distracted and get some order back. And so he, he starts to really get into this bid, bid, uh, bridge building. In fact, he got so into it that he became obsessed with building this bridge. And what he did not realize is that there was a, an insurgence that was coming in to destroy this bridge. They were going to blow it up. And so here he is trying to build this bridge and it's about the train is coming down the tracks and these spies have infiltrated and they've got explosives all over the bridge and he sees this happening and he starts to tell the Japanese do you see it look they're going to blow up the bridge and he actually forsakes the values of the allied troops and joins in with the Japanese and people are getting killed as they try to finalize this, this explosion and demolition project and when he realizes, there's a point in the film where he realizes that, and he says this, he says, what have I done? He'd switch sides. And he didn't realize it. And he says, what have I done? Do you remember? It? And he starts to pull up, pull up the cable to where there's the plunger. And he starts to go for it. And as he moves towards that plunger, the Japanese start to mow him down. And he gets fatally wounded. But then he falls on that plunger and the bridge explodes. And he makes atonement for his sins. He dies. You know what? Some of us in this room today, we need to stop and go, what have I done? We don't have to make atonement for our sins because somebody already has. 
Somebody has already paid the price and the penalty on a cross for our sins. Right, Phil? He's already died for us. He's paid the price. We just need to come back to him. And what this means when Jesus atones for our sins is no matter what I've done, adultery, murder, in Christ I can be healed. I can be clean. I can be whiter than snow. Wednesday night when we were talking about this, somebody mentioned this old hymn and we looked it up. And Lynette found it on her iPad and she brought it up to me and, and I started to read it and started crying when I was reading. Remember that? I started getting all goofy and started weeping about this. Listen to these words. There is a wideness in, the, in God's mercy like the wideness of the sea. There's a kindness in His justice which is more than liberty. There is no place where earth's sorrows are more felt than up in heaven. And there's no place where earth's failings have such kindly judgment given. There's welcome for the sinner and more graces for the good. There is mercy with the Savior. There's healing in his blood. For the love of God is broader than the measure of our mind and the heart of the eternal is most wonderfully kind. I need that. So Mountain Heights Baptist Church, do you need to return to your first love? If so, you will find a wideness in the mercy of God, like the wideness of the sea. Praise the Lord. Lord, come to us now and convict us or encourage us. Show us where we're drifting so that we can have sensitive hearts to hear, to see, to sense your warning. so that we can always know the steadfast and unfailing love that comes to us in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior.